So we are very happy to have Wenwei Ho today. Wenwei graduated at the University of Geneva in 2017. And uh, he's now a postdoctoral uh, fellow at Harvard, Gordon and Betty Moore postdoctoral fellow. And uh, this year he will be moving to Stanford as a postdoc. So today, uh, Wenwei will talk about uh, interacting phases of matter in quasi periodically driven systems. All right, thank you very much for having me and thank you for, for setting all of this up. I'm very happy to be here. Hope everyone's staying safe in this uh, time period. Um, if you cannot hear me, please uh, feel free to just shout out and tell me to speak, speak louder or something like that. Um, yeah, so today I want to talk to you about um, new phases of matter in non-equilibrium settings, uh, specifically in quasi-periodically driven systems. And I want to talk about how these new phases are actually protected by the concept of multiple time translation symmetries, which seem pretty exotic, but actually do exist. And um, they, they give rise to a whole new class of dynamical phases. And um, I'll be using my mouse, which has this hand, so I can seem to find the laser pointer, but I hope that's fine. Um, and so this work was done in collaboration with Dominic Els in MIT and Philip in CCQ in Flatiron. And um, the work is published here in PRX. And incidentally, it was published today this morning at about 10 a.m., so quite coincidence. Right, so without further ado, uh, let me just give a quick motivation. So in the study of condensed matter, we are interested in phases of matter, and symmetries play a very important role, uh, as we all know. Uh, for example, if you tune, say, certain parameters in some abstract parameter space, the system can undergo a phase transition from something regular to something irregular and perhaps there's another kind of phase transition. And re what really like characterizes or delineates th these phases is the concept of symmetries. Um, in the traditional concept of symmetries or traditional paradigm called the Landau paradigm, um, these phases can be understood in terms of the spontaneous breaking of symmetry um, that the different phases acquire. So for example, a solid has regular patterns of atoms arranged in a lattice whereas a liquid has something which is completely irregular, so there's a breaking of symmetry in this respect. And of course, recently we know that if you add topology to the, to the game, then you can get more interesting phases, such as symmetry-protected topological phases or symmetry-enriched top topological phases. So the basic idea is, is that symmetries play a very important role. But of course, in discussing all these symmetries and all these phases, um, what I've sketched here is mainly in equilibrium, so we're assuming that the system has settled down to some, for example, thermal state, and we can ask, does that thermal state break spontaneously that symmetry or not? Or in the case for topological order, usually we're concerned with the ground state when there's a gap, and we can ask in the gapped ground state, is there symmetry, uh, is there a, a topological order or not? So the question I want to ask, or, or the driving question is, is there universality in something away from equilibrium? Is there uni universality in dynamics? can we define non-equilibrium phases of matter? And more specifically, what are the roles of symmetries um, in dynamics, of dynamics, in characterizing these phases? So I'm moving away from um, near equilibrium or, or at equilibrium, and I wanna talk about something which is very far away from equilibrium. Um, so the first or one you know, scenario in which we can study a non-equilibrium system is to simply look at a quantum many-body system which is well isolated and not connected to a bath. So this prevents it, the entire system from being cooled to some temperature. And the system is undergoing unitary time evolution um, by some Hamiltonian. And this Hamiltonian could be time dependent. For example, we could externally drive it um, so that this has some explicit time dependence. But nevertheless, the entire system as a whole is undergoing unitary time evolution. And the basic question that one can ask is, you know, given some generic inertial state and under some unitary time evolution, if we look at a system locally um, at late times, what properties does it have? What's the nature of the steady state? Uh, what kind of, you know, um, what's the characterization of, of, of that steady state? And in this basic question, I've been a bit loose, but you know, you can make this more rigorous. Um, we, we kind of want to take the notion that the system is large, thermodynamically large, and then we want to look at the local sub region and we want to look at long times. But for now, you know, at this level, it's sufficient to ask this very basic question. Um, what is the steady state at late times of a small sub region? So this question seems a bit, you know, maybe 
esoteric, but actually it's not. Uh, it's been inspired and motivated by a lot of recent developments in um, atomic, molecular, and optical systems. Uh, for example, um, there are many systems which serve as, as quantum simulators. Uh, examples are trapped ions, cold atoms, and optical lattices, and superconducting qubits, uh, solid state defects. And these systems serve as paradigmatic um, examples of systems which are very well isolated from the bath and which are undergoing unitary time evolution. And they are also many body in nature because um, experimentalists have been doing very well in scaling up the systems. And we are now reaching the re realm of uh, many body physics here. And so th these questions are very natural to ask in, in this context. So the first question one can ask is, if I have this scenario where I do not have a bath, but the system is undergoing unitary time evolution, is there something interesting happening? And um, of course, um, most of our understanding is that, well, well, a lot of our intuition is that interacting systems are typically ergodic. So you can imagine that you know, the system is comprised of a bunch of spins or, or some quantum degrees of freedom, qubits, and they're interacting. And if you look locally as, at a sub-region, then the system being interacting can exchange energy with the rest of the system. And in doing so, you can imagine that the system will kind of equilibrate in this small region. So what, what, this, what this means to say is that interacting systems, um, if they're typical, if they're ergodic, will exchange en energy with the rest of the system so that locally at late times, this more or less uh, tends towards your, your usual concept of a thermal ensemble, uh, and this reduces to the usual coupling to the bath scenario. So even though we have removed the bath from the system, uh, locally, if you look at the, at the subsystem, the system might still act as though it, it behaves as if it were coupled to a bath. And the temperature and the you know, chemical potentials it, it tends towards will be set by the global energy and the global, you know, whatever conserved charges it has initially. Um, so in this scenario, this is not quite so interesting because this is um, similar as before. Uh, this, this reduces the equilibrium scenario. Uh, this is also what we call the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis obeying scenario in which many body eigenstates of the many body system obey something called the um, ETH, which uh, gives rise to this scenario. So we need ways out of this, of this scenario. And um, in recent times, people have found that you know, if you add strong disorder, for example, to an interacting system, then you can induce something called many-body localization, which is the many-body analog of Anderson localization in which the system does not thermalize. And so the steady state reached at late times uh, retains memory of its initial conditions and is not simply given by a regular Gibbs ensemble or regular uh, grand canonical ensemble. And this is um, a, a new phase of matter which appears in dynamics uh, is one in which is non-thermalizing. And so this is a positive answer to the previous question in that are, are there different um, outcomes or different steady states that emerge which are non-trivially related to just a thermal ensemble. I should also mention that um, one can also consider systems which are integrable. And of course, then this scenario does not happen anymore. Uh, integrable systems are one in which you have extensive numbers of conserved quantities. But the usual sense in which we use the word integrability refers to systems which are, you know, have a special mathematical structure and they're kind of fine-tuned. So if you break that integrability, then more or less you end up in this scenario again. So I will not really talk about integrable systems uh, in this talk today. But um, I've given you two outcomes. One is a thermal scenario and one is a many-body localized scenario. But at the end of the day, these states that emerge from many-body localization are still um, static scenarios in the sense that the steady state reach is, you know, not moving in time and it is just something which is, you know, one could argue is at, at equilibrium, even though it's not at thermal equilibrium. So the question one can ask is, is there something more exciting? Is there something where the steady state uh, reached at late times is in fact dynamical in nature, is moving? It is not simply something that has settled down and has defaced all down. So to answer uh, that question, uh, one class of systems in which one can get interesting dynamics and interesting behavior uh, is a class of Floquet systems. And why is this interesting? Well, it's because Floquet systems have the notion of a time translation symmetry. And what a Floquet system is really is, is a periodic, periodically driven system. Um, you have a Hamiltonian that repeats itself in time after some big period of t. So this defines a driven Hamiltonian. Um, 
so this relation relates two arguments or two two um, so it relates the arguments of the the Hamiltonian function at two different points in time. Um, this is a that, that dynamical symmetry and is quite different from the usual on-site symmetry that one thinks of when one talks about symmetries in in many body physics or quantum systems in general, like an on-site symmetry or a translation symmetry. So this symmetry is something that relates the generator of time and it's a question whether this actually gives rise to new phases. So in the rest, in the talk, I would, talk, I would, I would argue that this actually does, uh, gives rise to new phases and I would then generalize this to quasi-periodic systems as well. So you see that if you have a um, time periodic Hamiltonian, then to look at the late time properties, it suffices to look at the one period map over one time, which is called the Floquet unitary U of F, which is formally given by the time ordered exponential of the Hamiltonian. Um, so the, the two outcomes that can happen here, the first outcome is that suppose you were to express this U of F and you find that it can be written in terms of an exponential of, of a local Hamiltonian evolution uh, which is time independent. And I stress here that it's local. So taking a step back, if I look at this unitary operator U of F, of course I can of, um, define a Floquet Hamiltonian by taking the logarithm of U of F. But in general, this problem is not very meaningful because this would give you a completely non-local Hamiltonian and it's not very useful in classifying phases. So I, I stress the importance of locality in, in all my, in the talk and in the rest of the arguments. So there, there are two outcomes. UFF, if it can be written as a exponential of a local Hamiltonian after one period, then we would say that this Floquet unitary or this evolution is smoothly connected to the time independent Hamiltonian evolution. And the phases you can get are more or less the same as the phases you could have gotten in a time independent situation. Now, that is not to say that the phases you can get here are not interesting at all. Um, for example, you could have a topologically trivial, say, band uh, insulator, and you can drive it. And this might create an effective Hamiltonian, which is local and has a different topologic, uh, topological structure uh, from it. So this, this form of driving, Floquet, can induce different topological structures in the effective local Hamiltonian. But the point I want to make is that that is something that you could already have gotten from a time independent Hamiltonian, uh, except that you're just using it to engineer extra interactions to the system. So this is not an intrinsically new situation, even though it's very interesting from the point of view of engineering. And this goes under the name of Fouquet engineering. Right, so the more interesting scenario comes about when you have um, the unitary operator not expressible as simply a time, uh, as simply the exponential of a time independent Hamiltonian. For example, it might necessarily be decomposed into two parts. Uh, so you cannot combine, for example, X is some unitary operator that has to be pulled out before you can even define that there's a local Hamiltonian operation, uh, a local Hamiltonian evolution. And it might not be possible to combine X and H local into a new exponential of a local Hamiltonian. So in doing so, this allows us to, to um, po the possibility of realizing new phases or new dynamics, uh, sorry, new phases with dynamics that is not possible in just a time independent situation. And I will talk more about this and I'll give you a, a very explicit example of when this can happen. But let me just say for now that indeed, uh, examples that have been known over the past few years, decade, uh, are the discrete time crystal, Floquet SPTs, uh, with some symmetries or chiral Floquet phases where the unitary time evolution operator over one period cannot simply be written as, as some time independent evolution. Any uh, questions so far? I, I will you know, explain more about this in the next couple of slides. Okay, so um, before I, I explain about that, one issue that we have to contend with is the question of heating in periodically driven systems. So now if I have a system which is time periodic, then it lacks energy conservation. It doesn't uh, conserve energy anymore. And we're inputting energy in the system and we're allowing the system to also emit energy at the same quantum of energy omega. So if, we, um, so if the system is generically interacting, then by the same arguments as before, we expect that the system should basically 
locally, if you look locally, heat up to an infinite temperature and featureless state, which means to say that the reduced density matrix of a small subsystem should in, at late times tend towards the identity matrix, which is basically saying that you measure nothing in this state. So why should this be interesting? So once again, we need a way to control such outcomes and such behaviors, uh, at least for a long time scale in order to give a positive answer to the question, what interesting um, steady states can emerge uh, in these systems. One way is to, in to induce many body localization through strong disorder. And indeed, there have been many works uh, where you can combine Floquet together with strong disorder to achieve Floquet many body localization. And you can get new phases from that. Um, another way to prevent the, the outcome of heating to infinite temperature right away is to operate at high frequency. So by, by high frequencies, I mean that we are driving the system with a um, photon field omega or a periodicity uh, with, a, with a frequency omega, which is much larger than any local energy scales of the system, and which I denote by J. And by local, I mean, for example, um, the system has some local bandwidth or, or some um, local energy in which if you flip a spin or you move a particle around, this costs unit J. So this uh, was, you know, uh, explained more or, or explored more in these sequence of works uh, where it was understood how long uh, such scenarios uh, persist for, where there's no heating to infinite temperature. And let me very quickly sketch for you the arguments for what happens in, in high frequency driving. So I will not talk about many body localization in this talk, but I'll focus basically on high frequency driving. So the main idea is that if you have a large um, separation of energy scales, if the frequency omega is much larger than the local bandwidth, uh, and the system is local, then you see that in order for the system, this is a many body spectrum, in order for the system to move from this area to another area and absorb this photon of energy, it needs to basically um, flip many, many local spins of order j, uh, which cause order j each time. And this is a multi-spin process, which is very costly. Uh, and, and it is basically a very high order, and um, we can think of it in perturbation theory, very high order. And you can show that the rate, you know, going from one many-body eigenstate to another many-body eigenstate separated by omega is actually exponentially slow in the frequency. And this is a very um, quick and heuristic sketch of why this happens. Uh, this was argued for, and you know, th this is a rigorous work at least at the level of linear response theory. Uh, this was argued for in this, in this works. So subsequent works, uh, some of which are the authors of here, here uh, including me, uh, we you know, worked on this and we showed also that not only is the linear response rate exponentially slow, uh, what happens in high frequency driven Floquet systems is that the entire unitary operator can actually be expressed um, as the evolution of a static quasi-local Hamiltonian for a long time. Okay, so let me explain what I mean by a long time. So what I mean by a long time is that if I care about evolution of local observables and, and the system, um, I can equivalently just think of it as being, being evolved by H effective, which is static and local. Um, and only at late times does this description break down. And by late times, I mean that there's an exponentially long time in frequency where it breaks down. So what this implies is that the system basically has an effective Hamiltonian conservation, H of effective, uh, for such a long time before it eventually does heat up to infinite temperature uh, as per our, our, our expectations. And this effective Hamiltonian is, as you might have guessed, is not um, too surprising. It's closely related to high frequency expansions. Uh, the Magnus expansion is one very, uh, very, very straightforward expansion that one can write down in a high frequency limit. Uh, it consists of the time average of the Hamiltonian and in the high order correction and so forth, so on and so forth. Right. So basically what, what this shows is that at least in high frequency driven systems, you can still have the concept of um, a local Hamiltonian evolution and the system doesn't quite heat up to infinite temperature. But going back to looking for new phases, you know, so I, I mentioned that we kind of want the unitary time evolution operator to be decomposed, not decomposable into just a simple um, Hamiltonian evolution. Yet, I just mentioned that 
at in high frequencies, one way of not achieving straight uh, immediate death due to heating is to drive it at high frequencies. So this doesn't seem to square with the fact that we can get new phases just by driving at higher frequencies. So the main point is that indeed, while this is true, if you just simply drive at high frequencies, you will not get any new phases at that you would not have already gotten from, from time independent situations. You do not necessarily need to take the high frequency limit in the lab frame. So there might be some classes of drives where you have to go into some appropriate rotating frame first before you take the high frequency limit, and then you might be able to get this. So this cures two problems. You would not heat up quickly, but also have this special form, which allows for new phases to emerge. And one very quick example um, is that of a strongly driven, say, bunch of spins. I imagine that I have a bunch of spin halves, and, and I'm driving uh, in the x direction uh, with some Robbie frequency that scales with omega, so the frequency. So this amplitude of the drive is huge. Um, so, you know, in order to achieve the high frequency limit, ideally you would want omega to be the largest scale compared to whatever is in front of here and whatever is in front of here. But if I now drive it such that this amplitude is very large, then naively speaking, this is not at high frequencies because the local scale of this, this operator is not large compared to omega. Nevertheless, it is time periodic with period T. But what we can do is that we can go into the rotating frame associated with this operator. And we see that this is actually 2T periodic. And in the interacting frame or rotating frame, this interacting frame Hamiltonian is now 2T periodic. So it has a different frequency, but it is high frequency because the local energy scale now is only that of H0. And then you can define um, an effective Hamiltonian. So you see that this, this has allowed you to have um, the best of both worlds, no heating, uh, slow heating, and also the fact that you need to pull out this unitary. So now this is just more than just um, doing a rotating frame transformation. There's actually a lot of structure behind this. And this was um, explained in uh, this, the work by Dominic, uh, Bella Bauer and Chetan Nayak, which is that in this construction, we seem not to have cared about the, the fact that the Hamiltonian was time periodic at a time translation symmetry. What they explained was that actually in some classes of drives, that um, the discrete time transition symmetry of the Hamiltonian system guarantees that the effective Hamiltonian has certain emergent symmetries, which are protected as long as you protect the fact that this, the drive is periodic in time. You do not need any other requirements. Um, I'm giving you here a very simplified version of it. So imagine that you have this class of drives, which is strongly driven. Um, and gamma is a sum of local terms with integer value eigen, eigenvalue spacing. For example, as in the previous case, this could be you know, um, the, the, the drive in the sigma x direction. And V of omega t is something which is just time periodic. And once again, we see that this is not at high frequencies. Now, if you go into the rotating frame associated with this guy, because gamma has eigenvalue, integer eigenvalue spacing, um, this unitary, in fact, is periodic, but with a larger period. And you notice that if you evaluate this unitary at the original period, um, this operator, which I call x, has a special property that it is the generator of a Zn symmetry. And what this, um, this, th these gentlemen found was that if you have this class of drives, which can be generalized slightly, um, there's a theorem that the one period unitary map U of F can actually be decomposed as a very, into a very special form. So basically, first you have a small change of frame affected by V, um, which is just a close to the identity change of frame. But then evolution is governed by something where the, the effective Hamiltonian commutes with this Zn symmetry, and there's the action of the Zn symmetry in front of it. Okay, so this seems a bit technical, but if you um, got lost somewhere, all I want you to take home is that in a Floquet system of certain classes of this form, the time evolution operator um, will admit a effective Hamiltonian description in which the effective Hamiltonian has, a, has an emergent symmetry. It commutes with the generator X. Um, and importantly, let me stress again that this does not require 
the original Hamiltonian to be symmetric at all, all that requires is the fact that this Hamiltonian is time periodic. So you could perturb around this form. For example, you might say, hang on, omega over n, this amplitude is kind of fine-tuned. Suppose I move away from this. But of course, you could just absorb it into this v, and that, that would just simply redefine what you mean by, by, by the um, change of frames and what you mean by the effective Hamiltonian. But the very fact is that this symmetry, this, emergence, this symmetry is emergent, and it is uh, always there once you have these conditions. Okay, so that, that was the um, important point. Um, and let me now tell you exactly an example of a phase of matter, which is non-equilibrium, that can emerge if you have such a theorem. And uh, let me just be a bit more precise. When I say a theorem uh, and this approximate equality, what I mean to say is that um, similarly to before, this description of the system lasts for a long time, exponentially long in the frequency, uh, before it breaks down. So there's a way to make all these statements rigorous, but let me just give you the gist of it for now without the heating uh, complications. So why is this useful? And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me and ask at this point in time. Um, one way, I have a small question. Yes. Um, the rotating frame here, you're, do you mean it's the V or <clears throat> the V naught? Uh, no, the rotating frame is res with respect to this first piece, the large amplitude piece. I see. So you introduce kind of unitary transformation, U naught T? Yes. To, to get rid of, kind of get rid of this uh, omega over n times gamma term. Exactly. So once you go into this frame, you're moving at the speed of this. So this goes away, right? I see. I see. And what's the, in the theorem, what's the V and V dagger there? Yeah, so V and V dagger are simply um, dressings. You can think of them as small change of frames. Yeah. So it's not true that, okay, so obviously if you look at this Hamiltonian, it doesn't necessarily have a symmetry, to, uh, an on-site symmetry to begin with, mm -hmm. but the statement is that there's an appropriate dressing where that symmetry emerges. Yeah. So you need to kind of look differently, you know, uh, you, you kind of need to tilt your eyes differently and, and go into this frame. And there is this um, symmetry emerging in this system. Okay, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So, when n is not the integer, does that mean that uh, you don't have the uh, emergent symmetry in the effective Hamiltonian? Wait, sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry. Ah, sorry. Uh, when n is not the integer, yes, yeah. But, uh, that, mean, that means that the we don't have the emergent symmetry, the effective Hamiltonian, or do we, do we have something even if yeah, n? Right, right. So, so if n is not strictly an integer, so there are a few things you can say, right? Um, for example, you could find the n that best approximates um, mm. that, that uh, value that you picked and put it into, and put the, the difference into the v, into the definition of v. So mm. in that sense, um, you would also still have this description but what would change is how long this would last for. Um, basically, the, once you deviate from this ideal limit, um, there is a change of the time scale in which this description lasts for. But if you were to park yourself exactly at integer, then um, and in the limit when omega is large compared to all local scales here, then there is a long lifetime. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let me now quickly explain to you a um, new phase, which is not possible in a time independent situation that can emerge because of such a decomposition. All right, so we can, so once again, I, I, I copy and paste the theorem here. And I want you to, for now, ignore the fact that you have this small change of frames, V, and just drop them in your head and drop the, drop the fact that there is this additional action of x, which is the generator of a z and symmetry. So this is just a bona fide you know, evolution by a Hamiltonian which has a z and symmetry. So we know that a Hamiltonian with a z and symmetry um, could, for example, spontaneously break the symmetry. Um, what that means to say is that, uh, so, so for example, uh, if this was a z2 symmetry, the transverse field icing model, uh, in 1D, you would have this spontaneous symmetry breaking in its ground state. But once you go to, for example, two dimensions, then a certain part of a spectrum could have this spontaneous symmetry breaking 
Um, so this corresponds to a finite temperature symmetry breaking uh, as part of the spectrum. So in 1D, for example, you could also have long range interactions. Uh, and then even in 1D, you could have uh, a system in which a part of the spectrum spontaneously breaks the symmetry. So in, in that part of the spectrum, um, if, if the eigenstates of H of H effective come in long range or the cat states. For example, for Z2, they come in pairs of cat states S plus minus S bar, which is the, the, the opposite the spin flip version of S, where S is some configuration. And so at least for this part spectrum, which is up in energy, um, you can schematically draw some sort of energy well in which you say that a part of the spectrum lies within some symmetry broken well, and another part lies within some symmetry broken well. And I put this curly brackets to represent the fact that you know, a bunch of states could live here and a bunch of state states could live here. So if I'm ignoring the action of X, and if I imagine that I start the system with some state that predominantly lives in one of the valleys, then what would happen is that the system, uh, because energy is conserved, um, will start to explore its, re its phase space here, and it will stay basically more or less within this symmetry broken well. It might thermalize to, uh, I mean, it, it will spread to more and more you know, configurations, but the symmetry uh, is preserved in the sense that the order parameter is always uh, plus one, for example, here. So if you ignore the action of X, you find that if you measure a local order parameter, for example, SZ, it's basically more or less that of the initial condition. Now, there are two ways that this picture can break. One way is that we know that actually um, there is tunneling from this well to this well, and this tunneling is exponentially slow in the uh, system size. This is caused by the, system, the, the, the splitting in the energy gap. Um, and so at late times, with a late, and by late times, I mean a time which is scaling exponentially with the system size, you'll find that the system could flip here. So what this is saying is, the familiar idea that this is simply a metastable state because the true eigenstate for any finite size system is going to be a cat state. But if you begin with some um, symmetry broken state, explicitly symmetry broken state, it's going to last here, it's going to survive here for a long time before it tunnels out of here. The other way that this could break is the fact that this description is not true for all times. So there is heating, which is exponentially small in a driving frequency. So at some point, um, you know, the system would not even live here, but it would simply explore all of phase space because it heats up due to the fact that this system was realized by driving it. And I'm not considering any disorder in the system. So eventually it will heat up in time. But you see that um, this, this, at least for times less than this exponentially small in driving frequency times, uh, the system undergoes some sort of symmetry uh, constrained thermalization within this well. But now let's add back in the action of this generator X. And this action of generator X appears after every period T. And what this means to say is that it forces or it flips the configurations to be from here to here periodically. So after one period T, if you had your system was initially here, the, 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 the state would somehow flip to the opposite um, symmetry sector. And then after another period T, you flip to the opposite symmetry sector T. So if I draw what the order parameter looks like as a function of time, initially it starts out maximally in one of the valleys, then it flips and it flips and it flips. And what you notice is that it takes two flips before it comes back to itself, which means that it takes two periods for it to come back to itself. Yet the system was being driven at the period T. So the, the order parameter has responded with twice the period, yet the input frequency or input period was t. And so this is something which is um, which we can interpret as a spontaneous breaking of the discrete time transition symmetry of the system. Um, so more precisely, you see this scenario emerging. We are inputting into the system or we're driving the system with some input frequencies, which are integer multiples of omega. But somehow at late times, the system is responding robustly uh, with a subharmonic omega over n of the driving frequency. And if you plot, for example, local observables, you see that this undergo late, late time oscillations for a long time. And this we, we, can, we can think of as a you know, novel non-equilibrium phase of matter, 
uh, which now, nowadays people call it the discrete time crystal uh, and also the pi spin glass. Uh, the version I've given is a, a pre-thermal version where of course it doesn't persist to all times, but it persists up to the heating time, which is exponentially small in the, uh, exponentially long or uh, large in the driving frequency, which nevertheless is a very large time scale. And I should stress once again that this is not realizable in a time independent situation. It explicitly requires a Fouquet drive in order for this to happen. Um, one more thing I should mention is that, um, oh yeah, no, well, what was, what, what was it I was going to mention? Uh, yes, no, so let me just pause here and take questions. Are there any, any questions about this discrete time crystal phase? Before I have I a question, when we... Yes. Um, yeah, <clears throat> uh, so here, here um, you had a spontaneously broken kind of part of your time transition symmetry and you also had an internal Z2 symmetry, I guess, in this system. No, no, the system does not need to have the internal Z2 symmetry. Okay, so your, so your X, because your X sounded like it was the generator of some internal symmetry, but you're saying it doesn't have to be. Right, so if you go back to the formulation of this Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say is that H of T need not commute with X at all. Uh -huh. So okay. it does not necessarily have the onset symmetry to begin with, but it naturally it naturally emerges as part of the dynamics. If you have this class of drives, um, the you know the system when viewed in some rotating uh, when when viewed in some dressed frame has an emergent symmetry, even though initially H of T need not necessarily have it. Mm -hmm. it it's an interesting question to you know put in additional onset symmetry to begin with and then ask what new symmetries emerge, but at least for now, you, you don't need it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so, and, and that raises a good point, which is that the presence of this emergent symmetry, uh, we, we like to interpret this as the manifestation of a discrete time sym transition symmetry of the Floquet system. So I, I stress once again that this is only, um, th this theorem only requires the fact that the periodicity is T in, in time. It doesn't require any, any um, you know, additional symmetries on site or not. Question? Yes. Um, to, yeah, to connect with the Lucas question, you're saying though that you still have a symmetry for the effective Hamilton, right? Yes, indeed. So do I always need uh, any, like, some sort of internal symmetry for my effective Hamiltonian in order to have a time crystal? No, as I answered Lucas' question, um, the H of T does not even need to have any internal symmetry at all. Right, but the effective Hamiltonian has a symmetry. The effective Hamiltonian has a symmetry because of these conditions. Once you're driving it with a operator that has, you know, of this form integer eigenvalue spacing, and you respect the time periodicity of the system, the time periodicity of the system is enough to guarantee you this, this result. Okay. Yeah, so this is like a time periodicity protected you know, uh, description of the system. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and that raises a good point, which is why is it called a phase of matter, right? Because as you can see, a phase of matter should be something which is protected against or robust against small perturbations. You, you would not say a phase is something where you, it's fine tuned or you add in something. Like the, the transverse field icing model is a Z2 phase because you need to protect the Z2 phase. And in a similar sense, as long as you protect the time translation symmetry, the periodicity, you always have this. And, and nothing else. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So if you change uh, some parameter in the Hamiltonian, uh, do you encounter with uh, uh, phase transition between the symmetry broken and the unbroken phase? Yes, you do. So you see like this V, okay, so I, I kind of swept it under the rub, but you need the fact that H effective has a symmetry breaking uh, part of the spectrum. So uh, an example of a, an H effective that gives rise to a symmetry breaking part of the spectrum is say icing couplings. You need ZZ terms into your Hamiltonian. And whether or not ZZ terms emerge depend on what the original Hamiltonian was, V, mm -hmm. right? So if V was say strongly um, paramagnetic, say it was just sigma X, then of course mm -hmm. there will be no part of the spectrum which is symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this this outcome requires each effective to have, you know, uh, the the part of the spectrum to be symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and, and and in fact, as you tune 
Um, so you can add in a tuning parameter where you can add in a ZZ and you can add in an X and you, as you tune the ratio of them, you realize that this part of the spectrum does not break the symmetry anymore and you will not have this sun crystal. So th this is indeed a true, um, you will call it a phase transition, a many body phase transition mm -hmm. as a function of the parameter. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, great. So now I'll talk about uh, the newer part, which is the quasi-periodic periodic systems. And one, okay, so what is a quasi-periodically driven system? Okay, so once again, I'm looking at the closed system and I'm imagining that the system is being driven by multiple frequencies, omega one, two to omega m. Um, and I can write the Hamiltonian in terms of a Fourier series comprised of Fourier modes n dot omega. So, and I want to take this omega ones, omega twos, omega m's to be rationally independent, which means to say that there is no linear combination of them using integer coefficients that gives rise to zero. So basically the, 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 the idea you should have in mind is that they're just incommensurate frequencies, but this is a more mathematical way of saying it. Um, an example is in two dimensions when you have two frequencies, then you just take one to be one and you take another one to be the, an, an irrational number, like the golden ratio, and then this suffices. So you cannot find you know, uh, a, a zero solution um, except for the zero vector. An example of a time quasi-periodic function is this, I've drawn for you here. And as you can see very clearly, there's no periodicity in time. So there's no period where the system repeats itself. And naively, one would say that this system has less structure and dynamics than a Floquet drive. So why should we even consider it? But this, um, you know, okay, this, this thinking is not quite true. Um, one way to see this is to understand where the quasi-periodic time quasi-periodic function comes from. One can think of it as actually deriving from um, an extended space Hamiltonian. So you have a Hamiltonian that depends on two angles, for example, in this case, but in a more general case, it's M angles. Um, and this is periodic in this higher dimensional space. But what I'm doing is that I'm, I can evaluate the function at this trajectory, which is omega t, and that produces for me this, this plot here. And as you can see from this picture, this extended space Hamiltonian actually has many more symmetries um, than you would think, because if I translate by two pi this way and two pi by this way, it comes back to itself. So we, we can interpret this, or at least we interpreted this as multiple tr time translation symmetries of the system. So it's a very versatile tool because um, even though we only have one physical time in the lab, in, in physics, right? Of course, you can Im envision spaces where you have two, two times, but let me work in a realm of, uh, you know, uh, our world. And our world has only one physical time. But nevertheless, if you drive the system quasi-periodically, you can mimic the idea of having multiple times. And you can, in fact, give rise, uh, you know, um, construct Hamiltonians that have multiple time transition symmetries. So obviously the question is, given that we have identified such structure in the extended space, does it actually translate to something in physical time? Does it actually give rise to new phases in physical time? And um, so some of the open questions are, uh, some of the challenges that I, I will talk about in the next you know, 10, 15 minutes is, first of all, is there an analogous slow heating regime for which we can define this? Second is, how can we analyze quasi-periodically driven systems because now there is no single time Floki operator. It's not as though I can just look at one time, one unit of time, and just you know uh, exponent. Sorry, just just apply it multiple times. And of course, the big question is what new phases can emerge under such settings. So let's go back to heating in quasi-periodically driven systems. And if I look at the Fourier content of a quasi-periodic drive, you see that um, the Fourier modes are omega dot n which means to say that the system can absorb or emit um, photons in a quanta of uh, th this, which is a dense spectrum, because n, uh, n is just some integer, integer vector and this object can be arbitrarily small. So naively you would say, oh, you can hit any resonance very quickly and therefore heating should be quick. Uh, contrast this to the case of Fouquet, where there is a, um, I, I'll call this a gapped photon spectrum where of course, if you make omega larger than the local bandwidth, then it takes a very large, um, many number of hops before it can absorb the photon. And so heating is slow here. Whereas here, um, because the spectrum is so dense, in principle, you can always transition from here to here 
in, in very small units arbitrarily fast, or at least that's a naive thinking. And but of course, there's a lot more structure to this than just this very quick statement of uh, resonances, uh, which is that this quantity omega dot n, even though it's dense, it fills the entire real line, is highly structured. And in fact, how small it can get is a function of what the number of photons you're absorbing is. So n can be understood as you know, absorbing n1 of photon 1 and n2 of photon 2 to, to obtain a resonance. It's very well controlled. And it turns out that in number theory, you can understand that for almost all choices of the frequency vector omega, this so-called diophantine condition is satisfied, where how small this quantity can get is lower bounded by, how, uh, by some exponent, some power, some power law in n. And this exponent is related to the number of drives you have. So m here is the number of drives in the system. So you see that when m is 1, which is a flow key case, um, you, you see that this bound is just constant. But when m is uh, higher than 1, then this bound actually decreases. So as naturally as you increase um, how large you take n to be, then it goes smaller and smaller, but at a certain rate. So this suggests that if now you actually pick the kind of drives very uh, carefully, and, you, would, and you, you, are, you allow it to compete with this uh, energy difference, in a sense that we, we, we pick a drive in which the Fourier components, which govern the amplitude of the transitions, decay fast enough. And if we impose a condition that it decays faster than exponential, or at least exponentially, which translates to the condition that it, our, our drives are smooth in time, so we don't allow for any step functions or any like stepish uh, kind of drives or switching between, between Hamiltonians, but we, we think of Hamilton as varying smoothly in time, then you can show or you can argue that the heating rate, at least in linear response, uh, which you can plug in here, it depends on the amplitude squared, and there's some suppression due to the fact that you have to absorb multi-spin processes. The heating time actually is lower bounded as a stretched exponentially at high frequencies. So M, once again, I remind you, is the number of drives. So if this M is two, then this would be a uh, one half. So the, the time scale in which a system does not heat up is stretched exponential in, fre in driving frequency, which is still a long time. Of course, not as good as a Fourier system, but nevertheless, a very long time indeed. Okay, so we can, of course, elevate this to a uh, more rigorous theorem. And this is part of the work that we did, uh, which is to say that you know, in, if you have the condition that the system is smooth in time, it's local, and at high frequencies, frequencies and omega obeys a diophantine condition, that in fact, the unitary time evolution operator for long times, you know, and by long, I mean stretch exponentially long, is governed, uh, can be decomposed into two parts. One part is a time quasi periodic rotating frame, and another part is some static Hamiltonian. And, and this means that the energy with respect to D, which is a static Hamiltonian, is conserved for long times. So schematically, if you look at a local observable, like take any local observable that you want from any initial state, um, the system will basically undergo evolution by D. And so initially it will have tr some transients according to D, and then it will thermalize to an ensemble or a thermal ensemble with respect to D because energy is conserved here before eventually uh, heating up to infinite temperature and basically becoming featureless over time. And of course, the effect of this uh, small quasi-local unitary is to add small you know, um, wiggles to it. So there's some small quasi-periodic wiggles to it. So, um, and, and let me note that this decomposition, it seems very much like the Floquet theorem. Um, I should say that in quasi-periodic driven systems, a Floquet theorem is not at all guaranteed and there can be many obstructions. But at least for these conditions, uh, this decomposition does hold at least for a long time. Okay, so I will move on to realizing new phases with this. Uh, and just a small question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just basic, are these uh, Fourier modes HN? Yes. Um, are they generic? Do they need to commute or something? No, they don't need to commute. So, so H, H omega is your choice of whatever many body uh, Hamiltonian that you're driving with. And all you need to satisfy is that H is local, you know, decomposed as terms that act on a few sites or a few groups of spins only. It's, it's smooth in time, and, and that's it. Okay, thanks. Right. 
Okay. So this slide is a kind of a busy slide, but basically um, the idea is pretty much the same as I explained for the Floquet case. Uh, once again, we have the result that you have a long-lived preheating regime in which energy is not being absorbed for a long time. But the, the important point is that the high frequency limit need not be taken in a lab frame. So let me just very quickly um, run through once again the Floquet statements. You know, if you have this class of drives, um, the statement is that you have this emergent symmetry X. You can, so with the, with the introduction of more frequencies, you can imagine a more uh, richer class of drives. So you can imagine introducing multiple gammas. Gammas are, uh, you know, local terms with integer eigenvalue spacings like sigma axis. And you can couple them to the frequencies. So you drive them at, at large amplitudes with a rational matrix. So this QIJ determines the kind of um, eventual quasi-periodicity of the response that we will have. And the statement that we can make is that instead of uh, looking at one period, now we're looking at all times, and the unitary time evolution operator under this class of drives can be comprised of three parts. One, there is a small change of frame, once again, so this is like a dressing, and you can, for all purposes, ignore that dressing. The second part is that there is effective time evolution by H effective. And the third part is that there is some very large, um, you know, micro motion that is happening. So that this U0 is basically um, the, the analog of the X here, but written in continuous time. And, and maybe this is a bit fast, but the point I want to make is that this object is still quasi-periodic in time. And as a function of time, it will realize multiple generators xi of different z and i symmetries. Here I'm assuming that the gamma i's are commuting so they can independently talk about different symmetries. The upshot is that h effective under a quasi periodic drive will have zn1 cross zn2 cross znm symmetries, which we can interpret once again as a manifestation of the multiple discrete time transition symmetries of the, of the drive. And these symmetries do not require the original Hamiltonian to have them in the first place. This only requires that your system is quasi-periodically driven. So once again, this is a statement about dynamics, but in dynamics, you have this, uh, this structure in the effective Hamiltonian. Okay, so yeah, right. So naturally, one, one um, very obvious uh, generalization of a new phase is the fact that you can realize a discrete time quasi-crystal phase. So here I imagine that I have, for example, a Z2 cross Z2 symmetry of the effective Hamiltonian. So ignoring for now this small change of frames V and U's, just think about H effective. So if the system has, uh, H effective has a spectrum that spontaneously breaks the Z2 cross Z2, you can imagine that there are four wells, you know, four wells in which the system, you know, lives in which are metastable. And if I were to just start out in one well and undergo evolution only by H effective, then it stays there for pretty much a long time until it basically tunnels out because of small energy gaps. But if I now include the action of U0, similarly as before, U0 will start to transition me at different rates to different parts of the spectrum of the, of the different symmetry breaking values. An example is this, let's take U0 to be um, the product of these two objects, these two generators. You see that initially U0, U0 is one, so it starts out here, but at certain times, U0 realizes X1 approximately, and this is when time is roughly speaking an odd integer of T1 and roughly speaking an even integer of T2. And this can happen because under a quasi-periodic drive, the entire torus is covered agonically. And therefore, you can always realize a point in time where the, where the, where the unitary takes, up, takes on different values. Now, the, the action of x1 and x2 basically means that you tunnel to different values at different points in time. And you see that if, you're, if I study an, an order parameter, the, the order parameter would be evolving quasi-periodically in time. And the important point to note is that this, this time quasi-periodicity does not have to be the same as the time quasi-periodicity of a Hamiltonian. So when the Hamiltonian comes back to itself, it's not necessarily the same time as when the order parameter comes back to itself. Okay. 
um, okay, so here, here's an example, an, an, another example. I take one half, one half. So here, this, I'm drawing for you the driven Hamiltonian. And this is periodic in 2 pi and 2 pi. And as you can, as you can see, this gray box represents the unit cell. If I, if I now draw in R2, um, so of course, a torus can be represented in R2. I just extend it. And you see that, I'm ev sorry, sorry about this. I'm, I'm evaluating the, the blue arrow, uh, I mean the function along the blue arrow, and this gives rise to this signal. And so very easily from a bird's eye view, you can see that this system has a certain uh, periodicity in extended space, which is two pi in this way and two pi this way. Now this system, if, you, if I look at the order parameter S, um, can have a different quasi-periodicity. So the order parameter can in fact be periodic, not in two pi and two pi, but along this direction. So this defines a new unit cell. And you see that the response pattern is different from that. And so we, we can call this a breaking of the uh, multiple time transition symmetry because this happens to be a sub lattice of this. So in general, you can have different symmetry breaking patterns, not just a simple like square here. You can have like, you know, a parallelogram and so on and so forth. And this is a whole zoo of different symmetry breaking, breaking patterns that can emerge uh, if you have a quasi-periodic drive. And the, the basic message is that, you know, if I input the system, input into the system frequencies, which are n dot omega, at late times, it outputs frequencies, which are alpha dot omega, where alpha are the reciprocal lattice vectors of this underlying symmetry breaking lattice. And this is what we can interpret as spontaneous breaking of the multiple time transition symmetries of the quasi-periodic drive. So in, in real time, you can of course diagnose this by looking at the Fourier spectrum, at the power spectrum of a local observable. And you'll find that you'll see peaks uh, which are away from the integer multiples. While it is true that the entire real line will be covered, uh, nevertheless, you'll see peaks at, at places which are not expressible as simple linear combinations of the original multiple frequencies. This is a very similar concept to studying the, uh, the Bragg pattern, uh, diffraction pattern of a quasi-crystal, for example. So the, the, the question is, you know, your quasi-crystal is a projection from a higher dimension of space. You're doing a X-ray scattering and how do you determine what the pattern is? And you can still do it because many of the peaks are well-defined and you can see a very clear distinction there. Great. Um, I'm running out of time, but let me just very quickly wrap up by saying that, you know, these new phases go even beyond uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking phases. Uh, for example, you could study quasi-periodic topological phases. I just do a very lightning uh, two minute talk about this. So we have this decomposition, you know, there's an effective Hamiltonian, and now we care about the, the um, time periodic uh, change of frame. So if you assume that D is disordered, and suppose that we then many body eigenstates of D are like area law ground states. So you can think of them, morally speaking, as a ground state, which is uh, gapped. So what we can also classify as topological properties. Now, under the, under the uh, micro motion P of omega T, you see that this, this uh, state is actually time quasi-periodic and is moving on the torus. Uh, agonically. And so this is actually a map from the torus to the space of gap ground states, which we can try to classify. So in, in the Fouquet, for example, we can ask if I have, you know, ground states which are gapped, um, can I shrink the loop of ground states or not? If there's an obstruction, then, you know, this is a different topological class. So uh, the classification was given by works of Dominic and, and Trayton uh, a few years ago. And uh, so if you have a system that has also an internal symmetry group G, um, and the space that you're moving in is S1, which is a Fouquet system, then this map from uh, this space to the space of ground states, gap ground states, is in one-to-one -one correspond correspondence with the classification of equilibrium SETs and SBTs with symmetries G cross Z. So the presence of the Z is basically the emergence of the discrete time transition symmetry. And um, in our paper, we also gave a few more arguments saying that for the quasi-periodic case, you know, now the base space is TM, and so the classification becomes ZM. So, um, and so the, one of the big questions is what microscopic models can we actually write down that give rise to these new phases? All right, so, uh, so I am done, uh, but just, 
just uh, the summary is that you know you can realize non-equivalent phases by driving them with certain symmetries in time, um, and together with a description that prevents heating, you can give rise to novel phases which cannot be realized simply by Floquet driving or in time independent settings, and the works are here. Um, so some of the new directions we're looking in is uh, numerically investigating these systems and actually seeing the dynamics. Um, also, we're talking to experimentalists to realize these phases. Um, also, to construct explicit examples of the quasi periodic topological phases, some relaxation of technical assumptions. And the most exciting question for me really is, you know, we, we saw that the, the fact that the manifold itself has so many symmetries gives rise to symmetries in dynamics. So what other dynamical drives are there uh, that could give rise to more novel phases and characterized by other symmetries in time? So the field of non-equilibrium physics or non-equilibrium phases is very rich and very wide and uh, I think it's just a, a field which is nascent and beginning. So, you know, I'm sure lots of progress will be made in this. All right, so with that, I thank you for your attention and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Let's thank uh, Wen Wei for his very interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah. There are more questions? Uh, I have two questions. Yes. First of all, thank you for the very nice talk. Well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, the first question is about um, when you talk about the quasi periodicity, yes. when you have this Diophantin vectors of frequencies. Yes. The system is so quasi periodic that it doesn't come to back, come, come back to itself. So it's not really a symmetry to be broken from the beginning, right? It's more like a conceptual question, maybe. Um, so when you say it doesn't quite come back to itself, what, what do because you mean? Because it's quasi periodic. So it, it's, it, if you think about motion on a torus, it really doesn't come back to itself. It just well, it comes back to itself at longer, I mean, at better and better times, right? So if you take a rational approximation, then at those times, the error goes down as a power law. So it, it does come back to itself, just closer and closer at later and later times. I see. You're saying that, right. I, I, I think when you say come back to yourself, you mean like as arbitrarily close as possible. Correct. Not yes. necessarily exact. It, it, it will never be exact. It won't, won't be exact. I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the next question is actually, yeah, exactly this slide. How did you get the heating time T star? Right. So um, here's a very quick way of getting it. Um, so the heating rate gamma, right? So just consider linear response. Okay? Yeah. So this, this is just amplitude squared, which is all natural, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's, it's basic G squared. Um, this factor here, is basically the factor that, in, that arises from the idea of locality. You see that if you require transitions uh, that have a large energy gap, but your local bandwidth is only J, then th this is an exponential factor of suppression because you need many, many, many flips. Now you can make this argument rigorous, but this is a schematic idea that you will need to take the ratio omega over J and, and um, that, that suppresses it. But with this bound, I'm using this here in this factor. I which see. Is it. Yeah. And so, oh, I see. Yeah. And so now you plug this in, and then you take the several point approximation of this. Mm -hmm. you, you find the n that gives rise to the, the fastest heating rate, and that gives rise to this. And, and where is gamma in your final expression of T star? Yeah. So gamma is m minus 1 plus oh. epsilon. So I... for, for any gamma equals to m minus 1 plus epsilon. So it, yeah. yeah. I see. So you're saying that because we have this Diophantin condition, yes. there's still a lower bound on how small your energy difference could be. Yes. And mm -hmm. that saves the day. That gives you T star. Exactly. So if it's... You, it, mm -hmm. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, so the, the um, energy difference is going slower than the... the uh, going faster... With, so sorry, the, the, the decay of the amplitude is going faster than the energy gap. And so that, that will save the day. Right. Okay, good. Thanks. More questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, so for quasi-periodically driven uh, topological systems. Yes. Uh, what is this? What is the uh, edge state, and the, how does it look like? What is the edge state, and how does it look? Yeah. Like? So if you, if you make a boundary to the system, is there yeah. any edge state, and the, how does it look like? Yeah, so I think there are a few uh, options. 
the, I think the age state will, okay, so, you know, in, in Floquet SPTs, you can think of charges being pumped to the boundaries, right? After uh -huh. every period. And, and I think in quasi-periodic systems, there will be some, we, we haven't really uh, worked out exactly what can be seen on, on a, a particular model, but there'll be some quasi-periodic motion on the edge states as well, which is, yeah, I mean, you can, I, I, I don't really know how to think of it very well, but I, I, I think there is some uh, non-trivial thing happening there. So, so maybe various kinds of SPT phases pumped at different different time or something like that. Not just one, but various Exactly, kinds. exactly. So there could be various okay. FCTs being pumped to the boundary. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. More questions? I have a question on the uh, domain. So you yes. were uh, pointing to distorting the domain. So you have a flat torus, which is rectangular, but uh -huh. if you uh, shift it to varying the angle and the aspect ratio, Mm -hmm. Are there any interesting changes? Um, um, so by changing the torus, you mean in this picture? Oh. Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was trying to interpret this uh, figure. So, uh, uh -huh. you know, you've got geometric optics on a flat torus, mm -hmm. but I was thinking of looking at the moduli space of tori, so that's nice. parameterized by the aspect ratio and the angle of your cell. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering whether there was anything interesting in varying those degrees of freedom and whether they're physically relevant. I see. Um, well, I think if I'm not wrong, we can always express it in terms of motion on the flat torus. So even though yeah. you might say, let me derive my Hamiltonian on a um, manifold that is maybe has locally curved somewhere, you can always recast it in this form. Would that not be right? I, I think. Is that the question you're asking? Or? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's partly the question I'm asking. Right. I, I think you, you're able to express a quasi periodic drive in terms of a motion on a flat torus. So it, it, it would change the pattern on what it, within one unit cell. But. So I guess that you're, you're, are you arguing that there's a sort of a covariance where you can map one theory to this universal picture? I think, yes. Yeah, I'm not certain. I'm just exploring the, uh, the right. thought. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain either, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Right. I have a question. Um, is there an <clears throat> integrable example of a uh, quasi periodic time crystal? Is there an integral version of it? Um, what do you mean by integral? Just uh, something very simple that I can solve uh, more or less analytic, more or less explicitly. Right. Um, so this spectral, I this spectrum I drew in this response. Okay, I don't think it's in the same spirit as solving it exactly, but this can be derived at least in some high frequency limit. Mm -hmm. So um, I, you know, th these plots were obtained by taking a system with just basic ZZ couplings, icing, icing couplings, say in two <laughs> dimensions. Um, and then you can work out what the leading order um, rotation is, and then you can work out what the, the, the effective Hamiltonian is. And from there, you can work out what the response of a local observable is. And if you now invoke the fact that you're taking omega to be very large, then you can ignore the rest of the terms, and that's what you can draw here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in that sense, you know, the, the, the basic idea of a discrete time quasi crystal is pretty much the same as a time crystal where you just take icing, icing interactions, right. but then you're just kicking it or you're just modulating it uh, quasi periodically in time. And how about the uh, same question for SPT phases? Uh, could one imagine, is it, you think it's possible to construct a very simple model, you know, just to understand the basics and, you know, just work paper and pencil? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. We, we gave one example in the paper, but I don't think it's, I mean, I guess it's easily understandable, but as to the observables that we can get, it's not, it's, it's a hard question. Yeah. So I, I don't know of any simple uh, fixed point limit or simple uh, example of toy models that one can write down. Right, right, right. right. Okay. Yeah. 
no, but but it's a it's a it's something to explore. You know, it's it's right, right. with this new class of many body systems. Right. I mean, that's what people did for for. I mean, people were able to do it for for K systems, you know, the SPT phases as well as time crystals. So. Exactly. Yes. <clears throat> But in in the case for for K, um, it, it's easier because you do have the concept of U of F, um, so the yeah, for K operator. True. So by by just focusing on that, you can identify yeah. uh, what the eigenstates are, and you can see if they're long range ordered or not. But in the yeah. case of quasi periodic, we have to work away from that. So, in fact, it's my point of view that the use of a for K operator is a crutch in all of these dynamical phases because it forces you to think too much about U of F. Right. So could you say a little bit more about this? <clears throat> the last point of your last slide, you mentioned the new types of the, um, drives or something. I didn't yes. understand dynamical drives. I didn't understand the right. Um, so we identified that for K has a discrete time transition symmetry, and if you have a quasi periodic system, time quasi periodic system, it has multiple time transition symmetries because of the fact that it's moving on a torus. Now, I, I don't know, the, the question is, what other kinds of symmetries in dynamics can there be that give rise, give rise to new many body phases, not in, not in equilibrium? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, I have one more question. Yes. Yeah, so th there seems to be two scales. One is the T star, he, uh, heating time, the yes. other is the time when it comes back to itself or, or almost back to itself. Indeed, yes. How, how, are they, how do you compare those two? Are they re related or? Uh, so they're not related because, mm -hmm. okay, so uh, sorry, more, more carefully. Um, as long as you're working within, okay, so for a given choice of frequency vector, omega, right, um, the that only sets the direction you're moving in, yeah. right? And and um, you can push the heating time scales large by making it making the frequency larger and larger, right? Of course, that also pushes the time where it comes back to itself faster and faster. But essentially, the the times where it comes back to itself are, are the times when uh, the when you have the almost periods, which are the rational approximations of yeah. Omega two over omega one, right? Um, mm -hmm. But then the heating scale scales as, uh, and, and that time scale is independent of the of the system parameters, right? It only depends on the overall magnitude of of the frequency, right? Right. But but the heating time scale depends exponentially, uh, stretch exponentially, on the ratio of the omega over the local energy scales. So in principle, the, like those two can be separated. I see. It's scaled differently. I see. Okay, just because one is dependent, also dependent on the system parameters, the other exactly. only yeah. depends on omega vector. Exactly. Like the other, the other one only depends on how fast it's sweeping through it. And, and right. like, like the number of theoretic properties just set exactly where you come back to yourself with some precision. I see. So you, you sweep through and then you come back to yourself, but then the heating time depends on whether you do heat up, which depends on the physics. I see. Yeah. But I guess you would probably want your heating time to be shorter than the periodic time. Uh, but if you why, have why periodicity, then you're, if you have a periodicity, then you're kind of not ergodic. Although it is ergodic because it's quasi periodic. But as you said, you can go arbitrarily close to back to, back to the original position. Mm -hmm. So you would want that time scale to be as long as possible. So you can you can have a long enough time window to. Oh, I would actually say the converse, right? It's the fact that that quasi periodic systems do cover the torus ergodically mm -hmm. that allows for the symmetries to manifest themselves. I see. Right. So is the other way, like if you go back oh. to this this picture here. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I said that um, you can think of quasi periodic systems as just living on a torus, mm -hmm. and it, it has this symmetries. But why should the system care about these extended space symmetries for short times. So it's when you're actually ergodically covering the entire I see. space, I see. and then you're actually feeling that you are, you have the symmetries yeah, yeah, that, okay. that matter. OK, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Great. Great. Thanks, thanks. So thanks a lot, John. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.
Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. See you. I have uh, just before the speaker, oh, yeah. so if everyone can leave, I have one more question for the speaker if he was willing to take it. Yeah, sure, of course, yes. So I was wondering if there are any uh, field theories for which time crystals are effective field theories? Field theories for which time crystals are effective field theories. Um, I'm not familiar with them, sorry, yeah. No, just I did a, I did a quick. I just wondered how how prevalent that was. I just did a quick search there. So, you know, for example, some random search with the, the keywords brought up mm -hmm. some uh, work on effective field theories of translate of time translational symmetry breaking in non equilibrium systems. So, I was just interested how prevalent that, that set of ideas was. Oh, I see. Um, I'm not that familiar with those. Works. Hmm. Who's, um, whose works are those? I mean, that, that was just a random search well. Oh, okay, you're talking. So uh, the, the name there, I guess that's uh, Hongo, Kim and Ota. I see. Yeah, I'm not familiar. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason is that I, I'm interested myself in <clears throat> non-equilibrium symmetry breaking. Mm -hmm. and, and when, you know, basically your, your first guess at an effective field theory maybe mistaken because of the couplings which are happening in the field because of the disequilibria. So that's why whenever I see a system like, like you're presenting, mm -hmm. I'm always interested in what are the field theories which sit above it. I see, I see. So. Okay, I see. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for that. I just said <laughs> before, no, no, <laughs> before you hung up. Mm, no. And thanks to the organizer. I, I, sadly, I only got uh, into your talk late, so I, I, I'm sorry I missed. Uh, no worries. Good, uh, I, I very, think... very interesting stuff. It's it's a little late in Scotland. To, uh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. You're coming from. You're calling from Scotland. I'm, I'm based at the university. I'm a mathematician based at the University of Glasgow. Oh, okay. Great. Awesome. But I think your talk is recorded, so you can always. Yeah, the talk is recorded. Oh, super. Is is that on the the homepage for the Kadanov? Um, the link is not available yet, but uh, I can let you know. Oh, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I've just, uh, the, the uh, physics seminars have just started coming online. You know, there is this thing called researchseminars.org. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was paying attention to all the math stuff and then suddenly <laughs> the physicists have added their wow. list. And so it's, it's becoming very hard each day to decide what talks to listen to. <laughs> this is so oh, yeah, there's yeah, so yeah. many great choices. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's only a small portion of the physics because right now there's only 120 or so, you know, uh, physics seminars listed. And right now is like 700 math. And oh, I, I think see. it's going to, the physics will soon overtake the math for sure. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah, they started as a math project, I think. That's right. But it's a dot org and it's kind of, uh, you know, naturally uh, growable. So uh, biology just started and joined a few days ago. So there's uh, now a biology link too. So we're never going back to the old way of doing things, I think, after this. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe partially at least. Partially. Yeah, partially, yes. But I mean, I, I sure hope it doesn't shut down because the last few weeks for me have been incredible fun. It's like being in grad school again. There's just so many, there's too much <laughs> interesting stuff going on. <laughs> right. Okay, well, super. I'm looking forward to more, uh, looking forward to, um, to more, I'll show my face, looking forward to more seminars from Kadanov uh, mm. in the weeks to come. Awesome. Yes, that will be that. Thank you for taking my question. Take care. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Paul. Sure. Bye-bye, everyone. All right, bye.